does not seek confrontation with Russia. NATO aspires for a more constructive and cooperative relationship with uh, Russia. But to be able to establish that, uh, Russia must want it too. It wasn't that long ago the entire free world was up in arms over the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Talk of simply not standing for it and taking immediate action to save those being murdered by another dictator. Then, of course, along came other issues of import, and everyone seemed to forget that little slice of heaven. We haven't. And we're about to tie terrorism and a failing superpower into the discussion. Let's welcome to Midpoint the research director for the European Leadership Network, formerly with the Polish Institute of National Affairs, Lukasz Kulesa joins us. Lukasz, a pleasure to see you again. Thanks for having me, uh, uh, having me uh, on the program again. It's my pleasure. Let's get down to what NATO said. They are urging Russia to drop their support for the separatists in eastern Ukraine. This coming out today. Lukash, is it fair to say that whether it was three months ago or today, that when Vladimir Putin hears things like this from NATO, he probably turns to his advisors and laughs for several minutes and just enjoys the fact that he's playing everybody for a fool? Uh, well, Vladimir Putin is not known to have a great sense of humor. He's more a macho type, so he doesn't do uh, jokes very well. But uh, I guess uh, what what we are talking about... Uh, all right. No, I hear you, please, Lukash. Go ahead. It's fine. We hear you. All right. Uh, so then what we are talking about is, is really a continuation of what we saw uh, last year. As you very rightly pointed out, uh, other events, uh, including the terrorist attacks uh, in uh, France, in Paris, uh, kind of put this thing into the background. Uh, but uh, just uh, yesterday and today we are uh, watching news uh, about intensification of fighting, uh, about a shell probably uh, from the separatist side uh, hitting a civilian bus uh, uh, with uh, a number of civilian deaths. Uh, so, again, we are seeing the situation in which the Russian-supported separatists in eastern Ukraine are shelling uh, the other side, sometimes hitting the military, but sometimes hitting the civilians. Lukash, let's get down to some honesty here. What is the West afraid of in wrapping Vladimir Putin's knuckles even harder? What are they worried about? Uh, well, of course, they are worried uh, that the, this deterioration may uh, bring forward uh, this threat, this specter of a nuclear confrontation with uh, Moscow, then also being... Uh, but would that really honest. happen? Would that really happen, though? Let's be honest here. Would Vladimir Putin so. actually put his finger on the button and fire a nuclear so. missile at the West? I don't think so. Then we are also talking about the Russians actually being present on the territory of another country. Uh, so uh, talking about the Russians uh, in Ukraine, uh, they are not protecting their motherland. Uh, they are not protecting uh, their national territory. They are on other states' territory. Uh, but also being brutally honest, uh, Russia still is, in, is an important international player. At the same time that we have these events in Ukraine, uh, we have the negotiations with Iran in Geneva. And with negotiations in Iran, with Iran, it turns out that we would need, at a certain point, uh, Russia's support, uh, Russians talking to the Iranians uh, and managing some of the technical uh, details. So that's why you cannot completely cut off Russia and treat it as uh, North Korea. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think there is hope even uh, with the response that uh, we are uh, right now providing. No, we are not providing heavy weapons to Ukraine. But yes, we are providing uh, some assistance, including the financial assistance uh, to a country uh, that was basically ruined, uh, first by uh, their previous uh, regime, which was corrupt uh, to a, a great extent, and then, of course, by a war with Russia. So they might need more our money, our economical assistance and assistance in reform than they would need uh, heavy weapons. Right. And second thing, uh, we are also, uh, we've also uh, put uh, sanctions on Russia. And as you can see, the sanctions 
are starting to bite. All right, now we're going to talk about that in a little bit more. So hold on just a couple of minutes, Lukash. We're going to get right back to you. By the way, we should point out that today we're learning that according to Newsweek magazine, there's a report coming out that says Russia has started moving troops towards a new military installation that is just 31 miles from the Finnish border. And also they're looking at stationing a tremendous amount of the Russian northern fleet there uh, sometime soon. Back after the break, we'll dive deeper into the Russian way of life these days that would seem to include the dumping of American luxury homes and a free-falling ruble. That and so much more coming up right here on Midpoint. Let's welcome back to Midpoint Research Director at the European Leadership Network with expertise in Russian security policy, Lukash Kulesa joins us. Lukash, I mentioned that the ruble is in a free fall, and now we hear that a lot of Russians are dumping their interest in American homes. They're trying to sell and get out. Should we put these two together? Is this going to come to bear anywhere against the U.S.? Because certainly there are sanctions right now, but is there anything we can take from these actions? Uh, well... Luckily for uh, you, uh, Russia needs the United States much more in economic terms uh, than the United States uh, needs uh, Russia. Uh, the trade has been a, a real small uh, one. So uh, it's mostly Russia uh, which is uh, suffering. Uh, and uh, I, I'm sure, you know, apart from some, some millionaires uh, who uh, could not buy a piece of the, of the U.S., uh, real estate, uh, most of the, the ordinary Russians uh, would not have a, a, a direct uh, stake uh, when it comes to the situation inside of, of, of the U.S. Uh, but uh, what we are talking about here uh, in Russia is actually a perfect storm. Uh, we have the sanctions introduced uh, after uh, in, in the context of the Ukraine crisis, uh, but we also have a free fall of the oil prices and uh, we have the effect of uh, a years-long, if not decades-long, uh, mismanagement of the economy. Well, Lukash, so let me ask you this. Let me interrupt you for a sec. With all that you're talking about here and all the suffering that's going on in Europe and the fact that they can't find food at decent prices anymore and the ruble is in a free fall, why are the people of Russia still not, at least from what we can see from the outside, doing something about their government, saying something, rioting, revolting, anything at all. I know it's a closed society. I know the police state is there. But why is it that we are continually told that the Russian people are just fine with what Putin is doing? Uh, well, you have to understand that it's uh, for the majority of the people, uh, the propaganda, uh, the economic space, uh, which is totally or almost totally controlled uh, by the state, uh, and there, it appears to be a very diverse market with many newspapers, many radio stations, many TV stations. Uh, but you look closer and it turns out that there is a handful of them remaining independent. The rest of them is either openly or uh, partly uh, controlled uh, by the government. So the ordinary Russian, the so-called ordinary Russian, uh, no matter if he turns on the TV, uh, looks the internet uh, or uh, uh, or reads the newspaper, uh, gets the same message. And the message is that the United States, first and foremost, and the West more generally, is out to get him or her personally. That everything what is going wrong with Russia is the effect of the machinations of the schemes uh, of uh, the West. So, of course, the message is that we have to stick together. Uh, I have to tell you, though, Lukash, it certainly sounds a lot like the 1950s and the 1960s all over again. Uh, I got about two minutes left here, and I want to make sure I ask you this now. Who is Alexei Navalny, and why does he scare Vladimir Putin so much? It would seem to be that he's the guy that Putin is really scared of him. Well, this is one of the new generation opposition guys. You had old generation, uh, the guys from the 90s, usually very respected intellectuals, professors, uh, who were always trying to get inside the system and change it. Navalny is a new generation guy. Uh, he uses internet, uh, he uses social networks, he's very good at rallies. Uh, and his message is, this is a regime of crooks. This is a regime of thieves. And I can prove it to you. He had a famous website in which he listed, for example, luxury cars and residences of the Russian uh, elite. So because he is a populist, 
uh, and he's, of course, oppositional to the current regime. That's why he's so dangerous to the Kremlin. Would you see him, though, I got about a minute left here, would you see him as being a possibility of actually starting a deep enough grassroots effort to where he could unseat Putin and force Putin out of office? I think not him personally. In a sense, though, he, he had a chance 2011, 2012, but we need uh, dozens of more Navalny's. So people who are not from the outside, are, but are from the inside and attacking the whole system from the inside. It would seem as if that the Russians are looking for somebody, they just don't know where to find them. <laughs> well, you know, there are these guys there. There is a, there's a wonderful uh, group of uh, people in Russia, uh, civil society representatives. These guys are still there. Uh, this is not a land full of zombies, believe me. Uh, so uh, maybe we, we cannot uh, create these people, uh, but if they appear, uh, and sometimes uh, they, they don't need to ask about Ukraine. They can ask uh, mm -hmm. why... Uh, the, the, the tax authorities uh, just stole all my money. And this kind of there people go. are Let's, much more credible to the Russians. Let's at least hope at this point they come out of their zombie-like state, if indeed they are in one. Lukash Kulesa, always a pleasure to have you on the show, my friend. Thanks so much. My pleasure. All the best. You too. After the break, the toughest matter for France and European nations in the wake of the terrorist killings. Assimilation versus culture. It's on Midpoint.